I'm Dr. Jeff Kalshevsky. Welcome to my YouTube channel of Forensic Psychology. I recently received an email from one of my channel subscribers, Bethany from Colorado. She had an interesting question. She mentioned that she's working on a paper in one of her college classes about juvenile justice. She writes, in my research, I read that a person's brain does not fully develop until the person is 20 years old. So how can a court find a teenager guilty of a crime when their brain isn't fully developed? Great question. So let's talk about the science behind this question and the practical application of science in court through forensic psychology. First, the brain development piece. That is true. The human brain isn't really completely through its initial development or growth until someone reaches around age 20. Imaging studies show specifically the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. So what does that mean? Well, the prefrontal cortex is heavily implicated in what we would call the social emotional system in the brain and also heavily implicated in what we call the cognitive control system. Now the social emotional system controls the emotional state of the brain. When this comes online, what you'll see in teens is they have an increased need for a sense of rewards. They don't want to do stuff that's boring anymore. Teens will also have an increased sensation seeking or thrill seeking behavior. And they tend to be more reactive in their emotional response to both positive and negative emotions, right? The stereotype that teens are more emotional. There's also an increased attentiveness to social cues. They react more to aspects of social interaction and specifically they tend to be more susceptible to peer pressure. Now, the social emotional system comes online first before the cognitive control system. The cognitive control system is more of a rational thinking system. It provides um, kind of a check on the social emotional system that's already functioning in the brain. So when the cognitive control system comes online, uh, this tends to help to, um, dec or to increase impulse control. The adolescent is better able to think before acting. The adolescent will also have better emotional control. They'll be um, less emotionally reactive as they get further in their teens and that part of their brain develops better. They'll have more foresight and more detection of options. They can think of alternative, uh, alternatives to behavior rather than the first thing that pops up in their mind. They also have um, a better ability to assess potential outcomes and have more hypothetical thinking. So understanding these systems fits with stereotype, stereotypes of teenagers, right? Teenagers are impulsive. They tend to act without thinking. Teenagers are thrill-seeking. Teenagers are emotional. Teenagers are more sort of live in the moment, not really thinking much about consequences or other alternatives of their behavior choices. So the social emotional system comes online first, then the cognitive control system comes on secondly, and it's more gradual in its development. It's almost linear. So we know that 17 year olds are less impulsive. They're still impulsive though, but they're less impulsive and have more emotional control as compared to 12 year olds. Now, when a lot of this research was publicized and uh, the brain imaging studies started to come out say 10 or 15 years ago, there was a lot of talk in the professional forensic psychology literature about um, how this could affect juvenile justice. So could we give a kid a functional MRI and uh, then uh, he or she would be found insane or not criminally responsible for a crime? Let's talk about criminal responsibility and a thing called criminal culpability. Now, criminal responsibility, also known as insanity, is a legal concept that's well established in the law. Most, well, actually all state and federal statutes pertaining to this concept of insanity clearly state that in order for someone to, find, to be found not guilty by reason of insanity or not have criminal responsibility, the defendant um, has to either A, be suffering from a mental disease or defect. And in the case law, this is typically mental illness or pathological cognitive impairment. And that this would directly affect their ability to recognize the nature and potential consequences of their actions uh, or be unable to control their behavior to conform to the law. First thing, 
the teenage brain technically does not fit the criteria for what's been defined in the law as mental disease or defect. They're not mentally ill. They don't have pathological brain impairment. Essentially, they have normal brain development. Second, even if we did go with this idea that the underdeveloped teenage brain was a mental disease or defect, or that it was impairing to the point that the person would not be able to recognize the nature and potential potential consequences of their behavior or not be able to stop themselves in behaving, it's important to understand that criminal behavior is often complex with many steps, um, many behavioral steps and decision points um, involved in the crime and many off ramps from that behavior when the scenario plays out. In court, arguments for insanity due to lack of brain development um, or lack of brain development in teenagers typically do not meet that legal standard of insanity. Insanity, the standard is very high. Culpability, let's talk about that and how neuroscience has been applied to this concept of culpability. So in the law, culpability varies in the way the concept is defined and applied sometimes across different states. But generally, culpability often speaks to the concept of forming intent. What is the motivation or the drive to do the criminal behavior? And was this ability to form intent impacted by aspects of typical teenage brain development or a teenage brain that's not fully developed? Culpability is typically more often applied in sentencing in criminal cases. These are factors that the judge takes into consideration for sentencing. You often hear argument about a teen defendant's lack of emotional maturity impulsivity or emotional functioning. Uh, so I talked uh, on this channel about the Miller v. Alabama case, and that's a case that pertains to life sentences given to juveniles. Well, the Supreme Court decision in Miller v. Alabama talked about how a judge needs to consider the impetuosity of youth as it pertains to the defendant's ability to form intent in order to inform and make a sentence about a juvenile particularly when the juvenile is facing uh, a potential sentence of life without the possibility of parole. So, I hope I answered your question, Bethany. If you have any comments or ideas, please comment below. If you're interested in forensic psychology or true crime, subscribe to this channel. Also, pass this channel along to others who have similar interests. You can also find me on other social media outlets. I'm on TikTok, X, Facebook, and Instagram and everything's under Dr. Jeff Kelshevsky, forensic psychologist.